So let me first welcome Nandan uh, and viewers who've joined us virtually for this interaction being organized by Niti Aayog as part of its FinTech Open Summit. Nandan Nilakani needs no introduction. Uh, he's an extraordinary person, uh, truly a legend. And so Nandan, with your permission, I would like to skip the introductory para uh, that has been shared with me. Yeah. Instead, I would straight away get into the business of posing some questions. Yeah. Uh, the answers to which I'm sure, besides being informative to our viewers, would also help me in getting some insights into what the future holds for us as far as technological developments go. Uh, so uh, let me let me uh, first say uh, that India's if the Indian India stack is considered to be the enabler for the financial inclusion witnessed since 2014, where you played a very key and a critical role. I regard that as the first wave where the building blocks were established leading to the present times that require further innovations to help us move away from the traditional way of doing business, uh, thus enabling the next level of financial inclusion. What in your view would be the main components of the second phase? I think uh, in the first phase, we had Things like Aadhaar with 1.3 billion people, the world's largest DBT program, which was very, very beneficial during the pandemic for the government to send emergency money to vulnerable people around the country. Then we had the success of UPI, which has shown the world mm. what a payment system can do. I think the next big thing is what has just been launched, which is the account aggregator. As you know, it was launched in September and the very important thing here is India will be the only country in the world where every individual and every business can leverage its own digital footprint for its future. And this is a very important point because across the world, we have seen companies accumulating data and benefiting from it with things like advertising. And obviously, you've seen governments also accumulating data. The notion that each one of us can have our own data and then use it as we please in a safe and secure manner is really the essence of the account aggregator platform. Now, this was launched in September, if you re recollect, though the work on this has been going on for 15, since 2016. And it's an initiative of the Reserve Bank of India to create an ecosystem of what are called as consent managers. That to me is the next big thing. Uh, currently, that platform is doing a few thousand transactions a week. But that should not worry us because if you remember when UPI was launched in October of 2016, it was doing only 100,000 transactions. And today it's doing 4.5 billion transactions a month. So the one thing we have learned with technology is that once you put in place the protocols, the infrastructure, the building blocks, then they take off. And I think uh, in the next few years, you're going to see a dramatic growth in account aggregator, which in turn will lead to a large number of financial applications, especially in the area of lending. So I'll stop here, Amitabh, if you have any other questions on this. Uh, no, I wanted to take this uh, further because, uh, you know, with uh, rapid digitalization, uh, brick and mortar facilities in many areas, uh, they seem to be getting replaced by digital interventions. Banking is a prime example. And, uh, you know, uh, Niti Ayo uh, brought out a discussion paper on promoting digital banking in a systematic manner, yeah. avoiding ad hoc incremental intervention. Uh, what are your views on digital banking in the country? And are we ripe? Are we matured enough to take a leap of faith or tread with greater caution? No, I think there is a role for uh, digital-only banks, and I think Niti Aayog has done a great job in putting out this paper. The fact of the matter is that the pan pandemic has accelerated digital adoption, as you said. Uh, India is now a country with a few hundred million smartphones, and people are quite comfortable doing things on the phone. Also, very importantly, India is a transaction-first internet economy, whereas the US was an advertising-first internet economy. 
Uh, and uh, so a lot of the early business models on the Western internet was advertising oriented, like you know when you use Facebook and so on. Whereas in India, advertising revenues are not very high, and therefore we have built a transaction first internet economy, and that requires high 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 volume, low cost, efficient payments, which is what UPI does. And I think all the pieces of the puzzle are there for digital only banks. India needs many more banks, more competition among banks, and having a class of banks that provide a very smooth digital only experience is very much required. Wonderful. Uh, so this year's budget, you know, has been hailed uh, for its, uh, you know, focus on the sunrise areas of growth and for uh, laying down the pathways for accelerated reforms in coming years. And one of the initiatives that has received uh, great attention is the central bank digital currency. Uh, without getting into the technical aspect of it, can you demystify it uh, for everyone, its implications for our day-to-day -day life and whether it would impact the general public in any manner? Sure, sure, Amitabh. I think the, this whole thing began with uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, you know, about 10 years back, we had that, or 12 years back, we had the paper on which, based on which Bitcoin was developed. And then using the underlying blockchain technology of Bitcoin, we have had many other, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, blockchain platforms like Ethereum, which has its own currency, Ether, Avalanche, which has its own currency, Avax, and all that. So these are currencies that have no value by themselves. The value is because other people see value in it, or because there's a finite number of tokens, for example, in Bitcoin, there are only 20 mil, 21 million tokens. So you can't generate new, new currency there. Now, uh, result of this was that this was not usable uh, because there was no way to correlate that to the real world currencies. So a class of cryptocurrencies came about called stable coins. And mm -hmm. stable coins were based on the premise that for every digital dollar, there would be a real dollar behind it. Mm. And you could use stable coins. Uh, and whenever you wanted, you could convert your digital dollars into uh, uh, fiat or paper dollars. And the, uh, stable coins are a big part of the transactional stuff in cryptocurrency exchanges. Uh, when the central bank issues a stable coin, it then essentially it becomes the <coughs> currency. So that is a digital rupee. I think it's very good because the... Uh, we need some kind of an efficient digital currency and rather than private stable coins, which can be very unstable if there is a run on that stable coin because there's not enough reserves, a government backed stable coin or CBDC is backed by the central government. It's a fiat currency in digital form. I think uh, it will, uh, it'll, it's, a, it's a 24 by seven currency. You can migrate from regular currency to this currency and back. And especially because India has built all the payment rails of UPI and so on, it will be very easy to integrate this digital currency uh, into the uh, financial transactions for millions of people. And it will just help in reducing costs and aiding in financial inclusion and creating a modern digital version of our fiat currency. So thanks. And, uh, you know, a natural follow up to your response is uh, really your take on crypto. Is it inevitable? Are we as a nation ready for it? And uh, what are your suggestions to the policymakers? I feel, Amitabh, that the government has been very, very strategic and correct on crypto. First is, I think, it has defined a class of assets called as digital assets, which itself is wide enough to include crypto assets, NFTs, or whatever new form of uh, digital asset comes. So that's one good thing. Second, they've introduced a 30% tax on, on this, as, as well as a 1% TDS on transactions. So by doing that, they have acknowledged that these assets exist. At the same time, they're saying that if people profit from some activity, then they have to pay their fair share of tax. So mm -hmm. that I think is very important. So they, they are essentially saying that these cryptos are not currencies, but assets or commodities, like just like gold, which you can buy and sell and you have to pay tax on any gains that you have. So I think mm -hmm. that's a very smart way of bringing the cryptos into the, into the regular world. 
And what mm. they're saying is that crypto digital assets must follow all the requirements of India's laws, whether it's uh, Prevention of Money Laundering Act, KYC requirements, uh, LRS, or you know, sending money abroad, or paying taxes. They're saying you have to do it in a legitimate ma manner like any other asset. And on the stable coin side, they have promoting the rupee, digital rupee from RBI. So I think India has built, uh, designed a very, very sensible policy regime, which has been announced in the recent budget. Okay. Uh, but you know this, uh, uh, you're absolutely right that uh, treating crypto like an asset class, like mutual fund or bond or gold. Uh, but you know, blockchain technology is top class technology. And what role can uh, Indians and Indian talent play uh, globally uh, in, in the rise of crypto as an asset class? No, no, I think India can be a leader in this. I, and I think this budget move, which has uh, legitimized digital assets and the taxation of that will encourage people to, you know, a lot of people were buying crypto, but didn't, were unsure about how it would be treated by the tax, tax authority. That has been sorted out. Uh, so, but I think India will also be a big base for crypto. I mean, when you look at it, one of the very, very, very strong uh, companies in this is uh, Polygon, which yeah. has its own uh, blockchain. And uh, it recently raised a lot of money. It has all Indian founders. So clearly, there's a, and there are many, many Indian exchanges like uh, CoinSwitch, Kuber, and others. So I think there's a lot of yeah, young Indians will play a role in building out the digital infrastructure of the blockchain world. And then there's a whole uh, very interesting area of you know, decentralized finance, where mm -hmm. you can create financial chains without any settlement, without any central authority. Uh, and I think, again, decentralized finance with, this, with the proper guardrails could also be a very powerful thing. And I believe Indians will innovate a great deal in that. Wonderful. So the huge possibility for Indian talent to uh, be a critical driver in uh, the growth of uh, this new generation technology. But okay. uh, Nandan, this interaction is being watched by fintech experts and entrepreneurs. Uh, what is your message to them? Where should the next wave of entrepreneurs focus? Uh, what are the, going to be the key areas of growth and what should they avoid? Well, I think I'll start with what should they avoid. I think India is unique in its ability to create public digital goods, which provide a lot of the rails for the financial inclusion of the financial technology. So Aadhaar and other KYCs solve the KYC problem today. You can use Aadhaar KYC, Aadhaar, you know, fan-based KYC, uh, video KYC. All of them are digital methods of verifying yourself and opening a bank account or buying a mutual fund and so on. Then UPI solved the payment problem. And because UPI is a public rail, which is run by uh, NPCI, it's essentially a free rail. And you can do very high volume transactions. So you can't build a payment uh, app like in China, where one or two platform became very powerful. And then uh, today the government there is dealing with the consequence of that. So in India, payment rails are free. Account aggregator has fundamentally changed the way you think of data and has enabled companies and individuals to use their own data. So the first requirement of, uh, I think entrepreneurs in India is to understand that many of the things that don't exist in other parts of the world exist here. And therefore, they should not try to reinvent that wheel because they'll hit, upon, hit against a very efficient population scale uh, <coughs> system which they will have to deal with. But the opportunity is immense because India's financialization has just begun. India is a country where assets have historically been kept in real estate and gold. And for the first time, we are seeing a massive financialization of assets where people are moving their assets into mutual funds, stocks, bonds, etc. And, and crypto. And we also have you know, both its stock and flow. So there's going to be new wealth creation or new uh, savings that will come into the financial markets. And the existing stock of non-financial assets, which are there in the form of real estate gold, will also come into the financial markets. And the penetration of these products is very low, Amitabh. So hmm. I think any entrepreneur who can financialize this and take it to millions of people will do extremely well. Yeah. Uh, Nandan, I wanted your uh, take on where does India stand in 
uh, global fintech scenario because uh, essentially india should become a global leader and your suggestions for various stakeholders in this regard how can they play a far greater and a far more significant role to make india emerge as a global leader well i think you know many of the indian uh, uh, platforms and technologies can go global uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we are seeing that just yesterday i noticed that uh, some i think raise a pay about somebody somewhere and so on so I think as we build strong uh, Indian financial companies that are providing all these facilities, uh, and as they learn to, as they become unicorns or decacons or whatever, I think they will become global players. And uh, the experience they have got in India of providing very high volume, very low cost, highly scalable, scalable financial infrastructure for a billion people, which where they can just people can just tap on their phone and get that. That actually is way ahead of many other countries. So I think they can build a global business with the learnings they have from India. Nandan, you're also driving ONDC. I mean, you're you're wearing so many innovative caps. Uh, how do you perceive ONDC to change the e-commerce space in India? And how will it how will it help uh, the small and the MSME players in India. No, I think uh, I, okay. I'm just one of the people on the advisory board. I, I don't I think it's, it's uh, too much to say that I'm driving it, but I'm just one of the advisors. But fundamentally, ONDC is a transformative idea. The idea is that just like UPI in India changed payments, hmm. ONDC will change e-commerce. Hmm. And the reason is that the in the pandemic has shown that e-commerce is going to be vital to the existence of everyone. And if India is going to be a trillion dollar retail industry with about 20% e-commerce, that means there'll be $200 billion of e-commerce every year in India. And it's very, very important that every supplier in the country, every guy who's manufacturing something, every guy who owns a brand should be able to sell easily through these channels. And it's also important that every small retailer also participate in the e-commerce revolution. And essentially, ONDC creates a set of interoperable protocols that allow retailers to plug in, that allow suppliers to plug in, that allow dedicated logistics companies to plug in, and consumers to plug in through many platforms. If I want to buy something, I can just put out a request on the ONDC protocol, and some retailer can put his hand up and say, I have this thing, I'll give it to you for so much, and my shop is just a thousand meters from your house, I'll have it delivered to you with no cost. Similarly, if I'm a brand, I can find many, many customers get discovered on this platform. So essentially, it makes e-commerce much more inclusive and allows every small business, whether a supplier or a, a small retailer, and every consumer to discover e-commerce in a much better way. And it's based on very sophisticated protocols. Uh, they already done one hackathon, very, very useful ideas that come from the hackathon. I understand that the company is getting set up, which is a Section 8 company, something similar to NPCI for this. I think this is a great move. And I think the beauty of this, Amitabh, is everybody is bought into it. I think the government has bought into it. You know, Mr. Piyush Goel has been the leader on that. Uh, all the business leaders have bought into it. The technology technocrats have agreed. Uh, the financial sector wants it. The retailers want it. The suppliers want it. So I think there's a tremendous amount of energy behind ONDC, and I think that's the next one of the next big things in the next four to five years. Yeah. Uh, Nandan, since there are so many young viewers from across the world watching this, can you share some uh, motivational cases where Indian you know, entrepreneurs have shown tremendous innovative skills which can inspire others? No, I think, you know, in, in Indian entrepreneurs have demonstrated amazing things. I mean, last year alone, there were 44 unicorns. Hmm. This year in barely a month and a half, I think we've had four to five unicorns. While there could be some value compression because of the global uh, you know, interest rates going up and all that, there will still be a lot of successful companies. And I've interacted with uh, many of these guys, whether it's a phone pay, uh, which really built itself into an amazing company on top of UPI and all that, or, or, or Razor Pay, or Paytm, or Oyo, or or uh, Ola, and there's so many great entrepreneurs. There are too many of them for me to name. Yeah. Uh, Farmi, Z, there are many of them. And all of them are very, very young, very, very dynamic, very ambitious. 
and I think they will really make India proud. I, I really feel that India's young entrepreneurs will reshape the world. For example, small business, there are so many great companies providing tools for small business. And our small businesses are being brought into the digital world because they have to file their GST online, they have to file the income tax online, they have to take payments online. So these companies are actually helping a small business and MSMEs enter the digital world with very, very user-friendly, intuitive products. Uh, so Nandan, thanks. Uh, I would like to end this session by getting your take on something in which Neeti is uh, deeply in invested in, and that's women entrepreneurship. Uh, I wanted your suggestion on what can we do to drive women entrepreneurship in the digital world? No, I think uh, it's, a, it's a very, very, very important thing that you're doing, Amitabh, because I think having more women entrepreneurs is very critical. I think we need that kind of diversity. It's also inclusion of a whole set of people who, who may not be participating as much. I think we have to create an onboarding ramp for women entrepreneurs. I think today, uh, it, in many ways, it has never been easier to become an entrepreneur because we are putting in all the tools of the game in the place. You can you know, start a company online, you can pay your taxes online, you can uh, you know, do everything online. And the, all these other small companies are providing the tools for you to run your business online. So I think this is a great time. I think we, uh, and Niti can help in creating an onboarding ramp for women entrepreneurs and serve as guides to them to become successful. And also maybe create uh, networks and uh, groups of investors who want to support women entrepreneurs because capital is a big part of it. And too much of the, you know, the, too much of it is an old boys club kind of thing. It's important to open up the capital to women and maybe Niti can play a role in ma matching uh, young women entrepreneurs with potential pools of capital. You must visit Neeti and interact with our young team here. They'll get highly motivated and inspired. Sure. So we look forward uh, to not merely a virtual interaction, but a physical interaction during your next visit to Delhi. I'll do that, Amitabh, and thanks. And you know, congratulations again for your leadership and yeah. the amazing energy and infectious enthusiasm that you bring to your job and keep the nation flying high. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.